Egypt on the brink, protesters defy the curfew and troops on the streets to demand the president goes. More than 800 people reported injured as the protests spread. Is the tide of history turning again? Good evening. Hosni Mubarak has ordered the army onto the streets tonight to enforce a nationwide curfew. Protesters are defying it, demanding the end of what they call an oppressive regime that has failed the masses. But Egypt's president is Washington's ally, a key player in the Middle East. If he's toppled, it's a much bigger deal than his Tunisian counterpart. Tonight, what's at stake? We're live in Cairo. President Mubarak, who's facing an unprecedented challenge to his rule, has now imposed a nationwide curfew. But protesters are still on the streets in their thousands. And after a day of running battles, there are reports of troops firing into the crowds. Medical sources say 870 people have been injured so far. Internet and mobile phone services have been all but shut down. From Cairo, our foreign affairs correspondent Jonathan Rugman reports. Pandemonium in Egypt's capital. Riot police clashing with thousands of protesters. Years of frustration exploding onto the streets. In this, the most populous country in the Arab world. In the biggest rebellion against President Hosni Mubarak in 30 years. Down with the regime, they chanted, over and over. Down with the regime. We are saying enough for the regime. This is corrupt regime. We are saying enough for the regime. And this is The regime is a failure. Help us. People are being burned. The trouble began not long after noon. Egyptians emerging from their mosques after prayers into this. We watched a furious crowd confronting riot police blocking the entrance to Cairo's Freedom Square. They have acted with absolute brutality. I've seen them firing tear gas grenades into the chests of people from sh short range. It's hard to gather, but just from the glimpses of those pictures, there looks to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people on the streets this evening. Um, it goes in stages, essentially, when whoever's at the top wants to keep control to the bottom down. And first of all, it's the riot police on the streets, the tear gas, um, the, the rubber bullets. We've heard earlier reports of live fire being used, which really puts this into a whole different league in terms of seriousness and the extent that the military is prepared to go to to keep control. Knowing that Mubarak is finished one way or the other, I mean, it could be tonight, it could be the weekend, but it's more likely uh, to be, you know, at some time in the near future when he comes on television and he says, uh, yes, I've listened to the people and you know what, maybe it's time for a new generation of leadership and uh, please don't, uh, you know, attack my palace and uh, try and kill me. What's really important to note is that, of course, there is this complete defiance now on the streets and people feel absolutely fueled that this is their moment. I can, what I can see in front of me, a, a fair way in the middle of Tahrir Square, is an armoured personnel carrier in flames. We watched from here as a very large crowd surrounded it, got on top of it, started jumping up and down. We think that they opened the door and they seem to have persuaded the soldiers inside to get out. And then I think a petrol bomb was thrown against it or a fire was uh, lit behind it and uh, it looks as though I mean, it's burning in front of me. That is a, an armored personnel carrier, a, uh, an Egyptian uh, military vehicle that has been turned on by its own people in the, a square in the heart of Cairo. You can't really overstate how significant that is to, to see the military. We've been wondering all night as to what role the military will play in this. They were sent in by Hosni Mubarak shortly after dusk as it became clear that his police force had lose, was losing control in Cairo and chaos and anarchy had uh, really was reigning over on the streets. We were wondering how the military was going to be used. Was it going to be used to try and assert control? And if so, how violently? From what I can see here, it's been drawn into the crowds and they've turned on it, uh, certainly as far as that armoured personnel carrier is concerned, 
Uh, and uh, I, think, I think that's a fairly symbolic moment, actually, to see an APC uh, from the Egyptian military simply being uh, emptied of its soldiers and, and set light to. Uh, and further down the Nile, we can see the, the building of the uh, governing party headquarters still in flames, still thick black smoke pouring out of it. Uh, it's been met, certainly, in the case of that armoured personnel carrier with uh, the opposite people surrounding it, swarming all over it, then jumping on t up on top, jumping up and down, we think uh, persuading the soldiers inside to climb out. Uh, Tony Blair said the region was going through a period of transition. Look, it's, it's difficult to talk about these things that are very fast moving and so on. What I think is essentially happening is that there is a process of change going on in, in the Middle East and the whole of the region. And the question is, where do we end up? You know, because there are elements of people who want to see more modern, more democratic government. There are also elements, frankly, that would exploit the situation and take it in an extreme direction. Um, I think the important thing is, however it's done, we manage it and manage that process of change in a way that allows you know, these countries to, to, to be stable and for transition to happen in, a, in an orderly way. I must press you, what do you mean by manage though? You have an elite who've been in power for many years. Yeah, and the people you know, I deal with every day in the peace process, so I've dealt with and, and by the way had a you know, very good relationship with President Mubarak over the years. But a disillusioned youth, a younger generation, yeah. plus others who are now on the streets. Correct, but that's why it's important that as this process of change happens, it happens in a way that is stable because actually what is important in, in, for all of these countries, especially when, you know, in any event in Egypt, um, the, the, there will be change in, in time to come, there will be change in other parts and other countries in that region. What's important is that it happens in a way where the country ends up in a better place. People want the regime to go, they shouted while phalanxes of police reinforcements moved into position. Then the first of countless volleys of tear gas, the crowd scattering into the safety of the back street, and more gas every time they regrouped beneath the city's concrete underpasses. And when that didn't work, water cannon and rubber bullets. Over the Nile, there's bright winter sunshine, but look more closely and a crowd of thousands is streaming across until the police forces them back. Then an extraordinary calm in this rebellion, hundreds pausing for prayer before running back to the front line. A police post was set alight and the air has been thick with tear gas for hours mingled with smoke from protesters' fires. And amid the screaming, the shouting, and the wounded, this much is clear. Egypt's 82-year-old president has never faced anything like this. It wasn't just Cairo. This was the port city of Suez today, where security forces lost control of the streets. Riot police were confronted by crowds in their tens of thousands. Extreme groups could also flourish in a nation that has already produced Osama bin Laden's key lieutenant, Ayman al-Zawahiri. These protests underscore that there are deep grievances within Egyptian society. And the Egyptian government needs to understand that violence will not make these grievances go away. We do call on all involved to refrain from violence. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize that the people involved do have legitimate grievances. Smoke gets in your eyes.